I suppose I'll start with, the, with, the, with Iraq, um, which was best described by, has best been captured by under its old regime form, a brilliant author, an Iraqi English, half Iraqi, half English author called uh, Kanan Makia, who had to write for a long time under a protective pseudonym of Samir al-Khalil and wrote a, a, a tremendous book called The Republic of Fear, which is the best uh, forward description that one could have of the regime of, of Saddam Hussein. If you can get hold of it, and you can, if you go back to look at the uh, program that Kanan Makia and Hodding Carter once did for uh, public broadcasting, you can actually get to see one of the most chilling, annihilatingly chilling, actually, videos ever made in the 20th century. It shows the moment at which Saddam Hussein, the actual moment at which Saddam Hussein uh, seized power in Iraq for himself. Um, we don't have that moment in uh, Germany. We don't have that moment in Russia. We don't know the. We know what happened after the Kirov assassination in in Leningrad and the opportunity it gave to Stalin to seize supreme power. We know roughly what happened in the night of the Long Knives when Adolf Hitler realized that he could massacre every rival of his, in, not just in German politics, but within his own party, which is always the crucial thing. But with, with Iraq, we do have the actual moment, and you see it. The, the, the central committee of the Ba'ath Party, perhaps 100 people, are sitting in a very formal array in a conference room. And Saddam Hussein is chairing them from a podium, smoking a large cigar, and suddenly, without warning to anyone, in is dragged between two guards and in chains a, a broken man, a man who is obviously physically and mentally been utterly uh, destroyed. His personality has been evacuated. And uh, prodded a bit, he stumbles through a confession uh, that implicates himself and others um, in a plot to destroy the Iraqi Republic, to remove the regime of the Ba'ath Party, and to um, uh, ruin the Iraqi revolution, the, uh, the counter-revolution, in other words. He says the, the regime behind it is the Syrian regime. It could have been anybody. It could have been international Zionism. It could have been anything you like, but he actually implicates, in this case, the Syrian, the Syrian Ba'ath Party rivals. Having confessed for himself and having begged to be executed for his crimes, having been reduced to a state of complete abjection, the man then says, the following members of this central committee were with me in this plot, and he begins to read out their names, slowly. <clears throat> and as this happens, you can see it, the uh, guards move every time a name is mentioned and they, they grab the member of the central committee and lead him out of the door. And after about a dozen of these, the, there's panic. Uh, sheer animal panic starts to spread among those who haven't yet been named. And in the, in the hope that they're not going to be, they start screaming and jumping up and saying, glory to Saddam Hussein, our leader, all praise to him, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars of Iraq, um, praying that it won't be them who are called next. Nothing Nothing makes any difference. The, the harvest just goes on randomly. They're taken off the chessboard and taken out until half of them are gone. And the rest are just limp and done for and, and almost dying with relief that it wasn't them. Uh, it's the most extraordinary uh, live show of a, of a real, for keeps, political purge that you'll ever see. And then there's the second half. Uh, which has been seen by much fewer people and was not shown on PBS, uh, where the surviving half are told to go out in the yard and are given guns and are told to shoot the convicted half. Now they're in the plot. Now, they're, now they are cemented to the leadership. Now, Kanan Makir in his book says correctly, he says, Hitler wouldn't have thought of that. Stalin didn't even think of that, and he thought about these things a lot about how to get mem one member of the Central Committee to betray another member and keep them all guessing so that you're the ultimate beneficiary. But, but this is that added little touch of sadomasochistic genius. This is the adding of the godfather and the soprano um, to the mixture of Nazism and Stalinism that was, in fact, the birth of Ba'athist ideology to begin with, in case you don't know or haven't studied it. 
the Iraqi Ba'ath Socialist Party was modeled in large part on admiration for European national socialist and fascist movements, hoped to emulate them, <clears throat> especially in their nationalism against the West. But mutated by Saddam Hussein, it became um, also one that very, very much admired. He had a great admiration for and grew a special mustache in admiration of uh, the work of Joseph um, Vissarionovich, uh, Dugiashvili, the great Georgian known to us historically as Stalin. So you had in, in modern Iraq a, a regime in, in our own time that was, that was openly and directly modeled upon um, the two most extreme examples of European totalitarianism. And when I used to go there in those days, it's often very difficult when you come out of a country like this to explain to people quite what it's like when you're there, um, the atmosphere of terror, the, the look that comes into people's eyes when you mention the name of the leader, the absolute look of flash of panic. Uh, anything could happen to me now. Um, uh, the person who spills their cup of coffee in the morning on a copy of the party paper that has the leader's picture on it, and everyone in the cafe goes completely quiet. You just desecrated a picture of the leader. The police are on their way now. You've just made the biggest mistake of your life. And it's very likely that your family will go to prison with you. And maybe they'll have to watch you being tortured. And if they do, they'll have to applaud. And if they have to watch you being executed, they'll be later sent a bill for the bullets that were used to be fired into the back of your head and your neck because no one's exempt. And it's often, I think, very, very, very hard for people who live in civilized countries, democratic countries, to, to understand what it would be like to live even a day um, under a regime that was like this. I used, to re I used to find in arguments about Iraq that I knew right away um, when someone didn't know what they were talking about. And the dead giveaway would always be when they would say, all right, I agree, Saddam Hussein is a bad guy. I said, that means you don't know. You don't know anything about it, if that's what you think. You don't know what it would be like to be sitting at home wondering where your daughter was and finding out because the police came around and banging on the door handed you a video while they stood there of her being raped by their colleagues just to show you who was boss. The word evil which I began with I think does need a bit of justification. Uh, many people think that to use, even use the word evil is sort of naive or, or morally too judgmental or um, you know what I'm driving at, uh, too simplistic. And yet it's somehow a word without which we cannot do. Hannah Arendt in her study of totalitarianism borrowed from Immanuel Kant the concept of radical evil, of evil that's so evil that in the end it destroys itself. It's so committed to evil, it's so committed to hatred and cruelty that it becomes suicidal. Um, my definition of it is the, uh, the surplus value that's generated by totalitarianism. It's, it means you do more violence, more cruelty than you absolutely have to to stay in power. You've already made your point. You've done everything you, you need to do to make people realize that you're in power, but you somehow can't stop. There has to be a, a special appetite. There must be special prisons for rape. There must be special graves, mass graves, just for children. Uh, there must be the desire to see how far you can go. And even if you know this will in the end bring retribution, it's worth it in some sense for its own sake. Maybe that's the only redeeming thing about it. Maybe the irrationality uh, is, the, is the one saving the grace of it. But at any rate, it's not a word, it seems, that we can abolish from our vocabulary.